Thank you, and um, yeah, thank you for joining us. For those that are interested, it's a pleasure. For those that are just looking to sit down for 45 minutes, you're also welcome. Uh, that's no problem. Happy to have you here. So um, yeah, following on from Dr. Bellini's uh, kind introduction there about uh, the future, Weidman are, are key innovators in the industry and in looking at, at basically how we can, um, I guess to some extent, innovate to make a transformer smarter and using our knowledge of, of insulation. So for those of you who don't know Weidman, which some people don't, we are, as it states here, specialists in the manufacturing, design, and creation of insulation for transformers, both distribution transformers and power transformers. And of course, as part of that, we produce insulation systems, we produce components, and we also have, as a, as a, a separate side of our business, a division that are looking specifically at monitoring technology for those transformers that we're manufacturing insulation for. And, and secondly, we also have a engineered services division, which also looks at how we can use our expertise to be able to further develop our insulation products and ultimately make transformers more efficient and reliable for our uh, manufacturers and ultimately the, the end user. So just to give you some background, this here is Switzerland, Rap, uh, Rapperswil. Weidman is a, a Swiss company. We have operations around the world. Um, some key hubs are in the US, Asia Pacific, also other areas in, uh, in Europe as well. So I, I actually, as part of the Weidman monitoring division, because Weidman are so famous for insulation, I get asked a lot, why are Weidman looking at monitoring? What is it that, that's moving Weidman into this, uh, into this area? And you know, the, the, the key things to note here is that Weidman have been innovators for over 60, 70 years. So originally back in 1952, um, the grandfather of the gentleman <laughs> sat at the back of the room, the, the old guy here, uh, no, the, um, was, the, uh, was the inventor of transformer board. And of course from there we've continued to innovate, change and develop what we have today in our components and various uh, industrial papers which my colleague um, spoke about yesterday. So we are innovators. Furthermore, we've invested millions of dollars and francs over those 60 years. We have testing facilities both in Switzerland but also in the USA in St. Johnsbury laboratories where we continually look at that insulation that we manufacture. We look at the aging process of that insulation. We look at how we can improve and, uh, and, and create a better product that can last longer in its application in the, uh, in the transformer itself. So, you know, when we start looking at monitoring and why I get asked the question, why, why does Weidman want to get into the monitoring space? The answer is quite simple. It's that, why wouldn't we? We understand the insulation, we understand the aging process of the transformer, probably as well as a transformer manufacturer, and I'm sure we have a, a few here in the room. So why not use that expertise to to basically provide through the life of the asset that we're supplying the insulation for a monitoring system that can help the end user. So that is why ultimately Weidman are involved in monitoring. So, uh, excuse me if I just burst anyone's eardrums. Uh, so, so ultimately um, we have to get through the, uh, I'm gonna call it buzzwords, I think you can call it something else beginning with B, but there's a number of uh, you know, terms that are that are around that describe the, the monitoring sector in, in the energy uh, industry. So first of all, one that probably most people here have heard of is smart grid. And of course, you get asked the question a lot, well, what is smart grid? Is it, is it my meter as a consumer? Is it the smart transformer that someone wants to install at the end of the road? Is it the breaker? Is it the network protection? So we get asked this a lot. So, I looked on Google and Wikipedia and a bunch of other areas and, and, and this is the, the sort of closest I think I could get to what smart grid is in, in one sentence. And that is it's, it's modernizing the electric grid, using sensing, but also leveraging the latest communication technologies and you know I say that meaning 4G or utility radio networks and things like that. And it's to, to gather information on the network to act on. So that, that in a nutshell is, you know, is, is what, we, what we define as smart grid. 
And of course, the goal of that, ultimately, is to improve the efficiency and reliability of the network. And of course, as a network operator, um, you will look at the, uh, the economic viability of that as well. So, okay, you know, can, we, can we actually benefit from this economically? So that is, that is smart grid. The area I would personally say that Wideman are, are, are more heavily involved in through this development that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is the power system automation space. So that is ultimately using instrumentation, IEDs, control devices, to, to better understand what your assets are doing in the field in near real time or real time to be able to act and control and develop further how you utilize those assets to, to ultimately make them more efficient. So if we're looking at power system automation, I think the real question is, and, and speaking to a futurologist even who, who is looking forward, I think the real question is, given that our world is actually changing, is it best to continue as we are with analog gauges, with some simple measures, with Buchholz relays and so on? Or do we really need to change and develop something different in order to address these issues? And, and I think that's, a, that's a, an honest question. As, as consumers of power, as we all are in this room, as we are right now, I think we all accept that it's changing how we, how we consume power. So do we have to act or react to that and basically act differently as a network operator, as a transmission company or a distribution company? And I, I think we all accept the answer to that is probably yes. But is this really, first of all, something new? Because I, I think other industries have clearly had to um, react and change in order to meet the changing environment that they work in. So, you know, to me, a perfect example is someone like DHL. They use um, RFID radio frequency technology to track every parcel anywhere in the world. They, they're shipping 160 million parcels a year. And I think possibly 10% of those come from Amazon to my wife's account. So I, I understand that the, that the, the supply chain um, for someone like DHL had to change. So let's just look at the wording that you know, DHL used themselves. So they say, design, planning, execution, control, and monitoring of supply chain activities to create net value, competitive, leveraging worldwide logistics, so on and so on and so on. Isn't this just the same as what we hear with regards to the energy industry today? And yet this technology has been around with, with shipping companies, with logistics companies since the 90s. So is it just that you know, we're, we're now finally coming to this point of change? And when I think of the way, um, the, way, the way my wife ships parcels to and from with Amazon, it's the whole use of these logistics companies has changed. Today, you receive a parcel from a, a store. If you don't like it, you throw it back in the box, put the label on, it goes back. You can, you can have your own small account shipping things from a home internet business. Is this any different, really, to what we're doing with electricity today, where some of us are generating at home with a solar panel, so we're shipping it back into the network, we're receiving energy, we're... So, you know, ultimately, I, I don't think that the whole smart grid concept of monitoring is a new... Uh, philosophy. I think it's just new right now to, to the power industry. And another example is, uh, you know, is the retail industry. There's someone like Walmart, who are you know, 11,000 stores in 27 countries. Think as consumers how we've changed the way, we, uh, the way we buy things in the grocery store. We no longer want to accept that we have to have seasonal vegetables. We want to be able to buy something when we want to buy it. So you know, the way that these companies and these organizations and industries have had to, to react has changed. And, just incidentally, this, this truck here in the bottom left corner is a Walmart uh, prototype delivery truck. And it's actually a plug-in uh, hybrid truck. And you know the, the concern is obviously to supply 11,000 stores. The impact if Walmart one day decided that this would be a reality to the power network, where you could potentially have thousands of trucks plugging into the network to recharge the batteries, this would have a huge impact on the power industry. And, it actually, uh, you know, as, as we talk about consumer habits driving change, I, I have a friend who uh, works for San Diego Gas and Electric, and he said to me about, you know, this change in uh, consumer use of power. He said, you know, Frankie, I can define in San Diego the demographic of potential plug-in hybrid user. And what worries me more is that they all kind of live in the, uh, the same neighborhood. 
because they have to have the, the right amount of money to buy a plug-in hybrid, so they have to live in a, maybe a little bit of a ritzy neighborhood, but they have to be kind of an eco-warrior, green, chest-pumping type that want to be seen in a plug-in hybrid. So, you know, they generally group together, these people, and hunt in packs. So, you know, the worry that someone like San Diego Gas and Electric have is that, actually, all these people that may put this extra pressure on their infrastructure all live in the same neighborhood or within a few miles. And, you know, I said, so is this an issue where, you know, through monitoring you can... And he said, well, you know, he said, the biggest fear we have is someone like you. And I said, okay, what's that? And he said, well, you drive your electric plug-in car. And he said, but he said, the worst thing is you have also equally stupid friends that drive these electric plug-in cars. And he said, you have a party on a Saturday night and your friends come from all over the place to your party. He said, and you're the guy running the connector plug out the door with the multiple outlets so that all your friends can charge the cars to get home. And he said, this is, this is ultimately the fear that we have of over overloading the network and why we better need, and, and they, San Diego Gas and Electric, have a large uh, automation and monitoring project to try and understand better what the impact of, of this changing uh, consumer is going to be. So let's get back on topic to power system automation. So what is power system automation? Well, as we mentioned, it's, it's using technology, using sensors, using IED to gather information from the field, bring that information back, to allow us to better manage the network from a reliability standpoint, from an efficiency standpoint. And, and ultimately, you know, it's, it's about real-time monitoring where you can, you can actually react. Monitoring is not a new topic. We've all seen Qualitrol gauges. We've all seen maximum demand indicators. This is not a new theory. What's new is the communication side of it and the ability to be able to actually monitor something in, in, in near real time. And I, I believe that that's what's driving the evolution of, of, of monitoring. So the question is, well, why develop a smart substation today? Well, because all of these changes in our industry means that we basically are overloading assets currently today. And even, even today's assets, I hear this, you know, okay, 30, 40-year-old substations, uh, or transformers in substations around the world, including Europe um, and, and the US, you know, the, the expectation on, on network operators today is actually to run a more efficient network. And when you consider that the, the US network is 97.5% efficient and, and operational, so such a small amount that you can get back by being more efficient. However, if you consider that in dollar value today, that small percentage is worth 150 billion US dollars. It costs the US consumer, I, we have a US associate here, it costs you guys $500 each a year in the US for, these power, for, this, for this lack of efficiency. So, you know, there is, there is significant gains um, to be got through monitoring and, and, and better uh, managing your assets. And we have a, a, a video here of a, uh, I'm not sure if this will run, but we can try, it's a, um, it's a basically a, everybody likes a good exploding transformer, you know, and this is ultimately what we're what we're trying to prevent happening. So, as you can see, this is a U.S. transformer. It's quite a famous uh, video that shows various flashovers and so on. And and ultimately, by monitoring the transformer, the end game is that we want to we want to prevent this happening. And you know, this is in a rural location. If you imagine this is in a you know a downtown or a populated area, then this may cause a couple of issues. Um, let alone the power outage, but the damage. So this is what we're trying to avoid. So let's, let's get on to why transformers fail. And, and of course, as a <laughs> working for an insulation company, <laughs> maybe you can say that this is not the ideal uh, slide to show. Because of course, what we're showing here is, is that the, the highest cost of uh, failure and the, the largest number of failures is due to insulation failure. However, I'm sure to my colleagues from other companies, this is obviously driven by your board and paper, so uh, we, we don't need to worry. However, with that said, these are aging transformers. Insulation breaks down over time. As you have transformers that are 30, 40 years old, of course the insulation is going to start breaking down and we're going to see a, a, a failure in, in those transformers. So that's, that's the first thing to note. However, what this points to is that we need to be monitoring the insulation. We need to understand better what's happening to that insulation. And if we go a little bit deeper in, what we can see here is, is that the, the actual 
cause or the related failures is, is windings. So again, we're talking about the core of the transformer, inside the winding, looking at the insulation. And what I'm getting to here, you'll probably wonder whether I'm actually finally going to get on point here, is we're moving towards this embedded solution of having, having uh, sensors and technology embedded within the transformer insulation package. So let's go to uh, some references. Let's find out who, who kind of agrees with this principle. So we have the University of Karlsruhe here. I, I think Karlsruhe is a suburb in France, somewhere close to the German border. Um, and uh, the, university, uh, the University of Karlsruhe state in an investigation of breakdown of, of insulation that basically the degree of polymerization value is an indicator for the mechanical stability of craft paper insulation. And this, this is a direct look at the aging process of, a, of the insulation package in the transformer. And what this states is, is that the, the presence of moisture in the insulation system is a key driver for the breakdown of the insulation. So the key takeaway there is, is that they believe that moisture in the, in, in the, in the insulation is a, a, a key driver of uh, the aging process and reduces the degree of uh, polymerization. So onto this subject of aging status, um, looking at uh, DP. As you can see, the DP value of a new transformer is 1,200. So as we, as we ship a transformer from a manufacturer, as Wideman ship transformer insulation, the DP is somewhere around 1,200. At the end of its life, it's around 200. And this is, this is a perfect way to measure the, the, the breakdown of the insulation within the transformer through the life of the transformer. However, you can't do this on a, on a live transformer that's in the field. The reason why we know these numbers is because a, num you know, a lot of people have looked at retired transformers, broken them down, looked at the insulation and measured this DP content. So what we can see is, is that this is a, a, a direct measure of the uh, breakdown of the insulation. So looking at IEEE from 2005, their research, they state, and I will read this and there will be a question after this, that research shows that the degradation of solid insulation can be correlated and heavily influenced by temperature and moisture. So I have a question for you that maybe, I guess there's a couple of bright people in the room somewhere, and that is that what should we, based on this, what should we really be monitoring? Well, temperature and moisture. Okay, well done. Thanks to the guy there that answered that correctly. Okay. So please come to our booth and um, we'll give you some Swiss chocolate and cheese. That's fine. <laughs> so yeah, we have temperature and moisture. And what does temperature and moisture within a transformer mean? Well, now we're going to get sort of Hollywood dramatic cellulose destruction. And what that means is, is that temperature and moisture in the transformer creates this destruction of cellulose, which ultimately reduces this DP value, which means the transformer is aging and eventually will fail. So moving on from there, even more dramatic, we're calling these the transformer killers. So what are they? Well, your withstand level with a new transformer is obviously great because it's high. But if you introduce high temperature, you lose the, the, the age of the transformer or the age of the insulation in the transformer declines. If you introduce moisture, so now we're talking about temperature and moisture, this increases the rate of decline of the insulation in the transformer. Now I'm going to throw an extra one in here that wasn't on the last slide, and that is force. So that is the actual clamping force of the transformer. And I will explain a little bit later as to what that means and why that's relevant. So these are the transformer killers. So now we're going to talk about embedded sensors before we move on to those three areas. And these are the three key areas. So why do we want embedded sensing? Well, here's a perfect German specimen of a car, shall we say, a Mercedes Benz. Can you imagine if this, and this is a crude way of displaying this, but can you imagine if all the technology in this car was delivered similar to what we do with the transformer today? So it may look something like this with boxes stuck all over it and sensors stuck all over it. And, and what we're talking about is embedding the actual sensors inside the transformer, inside the insulation. So looking in more detail about 
Weidman's platform of smart insulation that is still under, uh, completely under development. We have a winding cylinder here. And what we're talking about doing is, is actually embedding temperature monitoring into the insulation itself using fiber, which I'm sure if any of my uh, colleagues from uh, Pfizer, for example, here, our partner, um, they will tell you that this is not new, and I agree. So we embed fiber into the insulation, into the key spacer on the transformer that goes into the transformer winding in the package to detect the hotspot uh, temperature of the transformer. Secondly, and this is where it starts to get interesting and unique, Weidman are currently working on developing a fiber-based sensor in the insulation that can actually capture the moisture content of the solid insulation. So this would be a world first. Today we use a calculation to look at the potential content, which is very, shall we say, inaccurate because of the way it's calculated using a, a consistent temperature. So what we're talking about doing is, is, OK, we can monitor the content of moisture in oil, but we can also give you the content of moisture in the transformer solid, in the insulation. And 99.9% .9 of, uh, uh, of moisture in a transformer is in the, in the solid hiding in the solid. So we'll be able to give you this information. And finally, clamping force. Again, we've just registered a, a, a patent on, on this technology. We're using the spacers in the transformer to actually measure by winding the clamping force on that particular uh, winding of the transformer. And these three areas, we believe, are, are first of all somewhat unique as a package and also something that speaking to our OEM customers, whether it be ABB, Siemens, they honestly agree that, yeah, we don't have a full understanding of, of these parameters, and especially once the transformer's out in the field and belongs to the, uh, the end user. So what are our goals with this? Well, you know, I guess we're looking at working, I, I mentioned to you, you know, the OEMs, the manufacturers. First of all, we're happy working with our OEM partners to look at you know, it, uh, what the impact of these different three areas are. But second of all, obviously, you know, th I guess is working with end users and, and helping them understand better what's happening inside the transformer, through the life of the transformer, to try and determine what the aging is. So if we look first of all at the, the temperature uh, monitoring. So we basically take a, a spacer that you would have installed in your transformer package as normal in the winding, and we embed in that a uh, fiber optic probe. And from there, we monitor the, uh, the, the hotspot temperature of the transformer and provide that, um, uh, yeah. And the, the spacer itself is uh, uh, pre-assembled by Weidman who manufacture hundreds of thousands of space of, spacers per year, but what we do is, we actually use our existing technology, so we, we use compression testing on this, we x-ray it, we look for voids in it, and so on, to try and ensure that once it's installed in the transformer, it has a limited failure rate. So we, we don't want fiber breaking or be, once it's put under pressure in that spacer, um, failing. Okay, now we're on to the uh, I guess to some degree, the, the, the more interesting uh, new development of moisture in oil and solid insulation. So as I'm sure you're aware, there are, there are a number of ways that moisture gen is generated in a transformer. So you know, the most common, I guess, is, uh, is first of all, as cellulose uh, degrades, you get, a, you get moisture generated in the, in the transformer. Secondly, um, leaking gaskets. So as a transformer ages um, and the, the gaskets start to corrode somewhat, you may have moisture ingress through these areas. Thirdly is the cooling system. Again, as the transformer ages, you may have some water ingress through the cooling system. So the content of, of moisture in the transformer will change throughout its life. And as we talked about, that content of moisture directly impacts the breakdown of the insulation and can cause the transformer to fail. So understanding the total content of moisture in the transformer. And, and we say here, moisture in your transformer can reduce the life by eight times. Now, it's very difficult to say if that's an ex you know, that's obviously not an exact number, but that's a, a guide given by the IEEE as to, as to what moisture content will do to your transformer. And, you know, the other thing to talk about, and this links to the, the force monitor that I mentioned, is that, you know, 
when you have moisture in a transformer, obviously the paper's like a sponge or the board is like a sponge. So it absorbs that moisture, which can potentially change the consistency of the insulation, which can impact the clamping force on the transformer. So with that said, that links us to the, uh, the, the, the winding force of the transformer. So, you know, in, in the event of a short circuit, obviously, as I'm sure you're all aware as people in the power industry, the last thing you need is a transformer that's not clamped correctly. Because when a short circuit goes through the transformer, your windings can move and ultimately can destroy the transformer. So I asked the question, well, why don't we just use a strain gauge at the top of the transformer, just measure the pressure of the clamping plate? And the answer to that is, well, ultimately, you would miss what the key information is, which is, OK, if we're in the key spaces in the, in the transformer itself, we're actually looking at this different swelling, de uh, decreasing of the, uh, of the insulation and changes within the transformer, not necessarily the bolting mechanism of the, of the clamping ring. So we basically um, use key spaces with a fiber optic monitor embedded in there. As I mentioned, we have a, a, a patent on that to look at the pressure that's on each individual winding so that we would be able to tell you if there's any change in, in, in clamping force on that particular winding. And you know there are a number of areas, so temperature, load, um, contribute to thermal expansion, and uh, you know, all, of these, all of these parameters within the transformer, when you look at temperature, moisture, and force, can be, can be collected and, and, and delivered, I guess. And we're not, I, I guess to some degree, we're not discounting here, of course, other areas. We, you know, things like uh, dissolved gas in oil uh, monitoring analysis online, this certainly has value and can, and can um, provide further insight into what is going on in your transformer and, and what is creating um, problems in your transformer and causing it to potentially fail in the future. And, and partial discharge, bushing monitoring, uh, load tap changer, and so on. All of these are key areas we, we fully accept that can complement very much um, what we believe to be this embedded, embedded platform. And of course, you, you know, the, the, the other question, I, I spoke to someone from IBM recently, and IBM are investing heavily in big data management for utilities, because this is a huge issue now. I mean, Weidman are talking about um, providing a monitoring platform. There are, if you walk around here, you can go visit a number of companies that's providing monitoring platforms. All of this is bringing data back to the, back to the utility. And of course, you've got to work out what to do with that data. And there are some of the largest companies in the world today, whether it be your IBMs, whether it be Cisco, all investing Oracle in big data management for utilities. Because key to this, is getting that information back, and we break it down into three areas. So we, we have load dispatch, so better managing your network, understanding where you load and shifting load to better um, manage and have higher efficiency on your network. Operational needs, so what do we need to understand from a reporting perspective? Maintenance, so what is our maintenance strategy? Where should our focus be from a maintenance perspective? And these are all areas that the data that is coming from the field needs to be managed and provided to the utility so that they can do these things here, which is supporting critical um, decision making, operational based monitoring, um, and also actionable information, not data. And I hear that a lot from end users. They basically are telling me quite often, we don't want dumping of data. We need actionable data. We need to know when there's a problem, when there's a change on the network. Yes, it's nice to have the historical database of, of data, but ultimately, we want actionable data. So finally, um, what are we actually looking for then? Well, we're looking for the sweet spot, really, as an end user, as, a, as an asset owner. And the sweet spot is looking at how do I manage my risk and how do I manage my loss of life on a transformer without basically having a failure. So I have to look at my emergency contingency plans, my utilization rate. I look at my risk. I look at my health index. And from there, what I'm trying to work out is what is the most efficient way I can, I can run this asset, this transformer. And that is ultimately what, what we're trying to achieve here. And by finding that spot, my network is more efficient. 
I can reduce my uh, capital overhead so I can, I can understand where I need to spend money and where I don't need to spend money. And ultimately, I can protect against outages and, and, and other problems associated with that. And of course, the driver of that is both regulation and the fact that you know, utilities are, are challenged to be more efficient, to be more reliable, and this is all recorded in KPIs and data. So ultimately, software has to play a, a big part in this. I, and that is, I guess, all I really wanted to say today about the Weidman development. We're actively working and looking for partners both on the OEM side and on the end user side as we further develop our uh, TMF, Temperature Moisture Force, platform. So I welcome any questions or if anybody wants to come and visit us, we're up in 4.2. Uh, upstairs, we have a booth up there, and you're more than welcome to come and talk to us in more detail. Thank you.